Hey, uh, folks in the audience, I know that there'll be folks uh, joining in uh, remotely as well. Uh, so welcome. Uh, so welcome to the ACM Baltimore chapter uh, and IEEE EMB Baltimore chapter joint seminar. Uh, we haven't had this uh, for a while, uh, the ACM uh, Baltimore chapter and then uh, Carol Carey, who is the chair for IEEE EMB Baltimore chapter, uh, suggested to have a seminar which you are going to listen um, from Dr. Taufi Hassan a uh, little while. Uh, we thought we'll just do a joint seminar. Right, so I'm very pleased to have, uh, you know, been hosted here in Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab and some of the past uh, ACM seminars which are also in the YouTube. Uh, you should be able to look at those. And so I'll just give a little bit of a brief introduction to ACM Baltimore chapter. Uh, this was established in 2022. Actually, it was established 2021 but then we had the first inaugural seminar uh, on February, I think February 24, 2022. And we had some distinguished uh, speakers, including uh, Dr. Len Kleinrock, who is kind of father of ARPANET, who invented the packet switching. Um, and then uh, followed by that, we had a series of seminars. Uh, each of the seminar, we had at least had two talks uh, but I'd like to introduce my colleagues and teammates here. Uh, so I'm Ashutosh Dutt, I'm the chair uh, for the Baltimore chapter. Uh, Jeffrey Javis, the vice chair, Random Goin, uh, webmaster Tamim Sakur, the secretary, Ken Smith, the membership development chair, and uh, Wale Akinpalu, who is the treasurer of uh, ACM Baltimore chapter. And um, so we have been engaged uh, quite a lot. And um, Wale is here in person. Um, so I will invite Wale to give a little bit of a rundown of some of the events that we did. I mean, this is uh, the glimpses of the first Baltimore chapter event, kickoff seminar, as you can see, we had the ACM chair or president of ACM, Professor Gabriel Kotsis, uh, Dr. Ralph Samel, who is the director of GHEAPL, got the introductory mark, um, Professor Len Kleindrop from UCLA, and the father of packet switching on ARPANET, uh, and Dr. April Erickson and Professor Henning Shulgerin. So they are our pioneer uh, kick-up seminar speakers. So at this time, um, Wale, I'd like to introduce Wale uh, to run through some of the highlights of past before we hand it over to Carol to introduce our speaker. Uh, so well, Wale Wakinpelu, my colleague at Hopkins. Thank you so much, Ashutosh. Yeah. Again, I want to join Ashutosh in welcoming all of you to this event. This is really a, a, a great collaboration between ACM and IEEE, and I think we should do, we're gonna do more of this as we proceed. Uh, in April of 2022, uh, we had a seminar, you know, where we invited uh, Steve Belovin. Some of you remember him, uh, Steve Belovin from Columbia. Uh, he was one of the gurus from the Appanet, uh, and he gave us the interesting talk. And then we also have Dr. Anupan Joshi uh, as well from U.S. and Marilyn, uh, Baltimore County. And then in August of 2022, uh, we had uh, three uh, fabulous talk. Uh, Professor Raj Jain uh, from uh, University of Washington, St. Louis. And also we have uh, Albert Greenberg. Some of you remember Albert from Bell Labs, who's now uh, in, in Uber, who's really leading the engineering and the research there. And then we also have uh, Milin Gambi from um, uh, you know, Uber as well, who is really shadowing Albert. You know, some of you really remember a lot of the research that was done by Albert, you know, really very, uh, very strong in computer and, uh, science and engineering. And then in October of 18 of 2022, uh, we had uh, Gravilla Waters uh, and uh, Amen Rad uh, Marashaki. Marashaki, you know, some of you who have been watching news will remember him. He was uh, the, uh, uh, the, the guru uh, for, uh, in New York, mayor for, for the mayor there before he moved on to Navidia. Uh, and he was a uh, White House fellow. And Gravely Waters also uh, is one, one of the renowned experts as well. And that was a really a fascinating talk. And then in February of 13 of 2023, we invited Misha Doha uh, from uh, Eric Erickson and Kumar Vajra Mishra from uh, US Army Research Lab 
Then uh, Anna Delphi, which is just uh, if, uh, stone uh, thrown from, from here. You know, we are really looking for collaboration, not just for the academy, but also for the industry. And these two uh, people really gave us their insights in terms of uh, you know, where corporations are going and how can we collaborate you know, with students and, uh, and also for the industry as well and academia. And then on, in April of 2023, we invited Samit Roy uh, and uh, John Barras. Fascinating talk from, from, from both of them. Uh, Samit is from uh, Engineering University of Washington and uh, Barras is from uh, College Park. Uh, and uh, it was well attended. I remember we had people from all over the world at this event. I was, it was amazing, you know, people were from Germany, people were from uh, Asia, people were from Africa, and they were actually, you know, people were really, really interested in the topics that we presented. So, you know, please spread the word. You know, this is not just for us here. Yeah, we really want to make sure that, you know, we create the next generations of engineers and computer scientists that can take the world to the next, next stage. And uh, this is a glimpse of uh, some of the kickoffs uh, pitch, pictures that we had. Uh, you know, in the middle there, you will see uh, Dr. Simon, who is the director of APL. And uh, he gave us, you know, a little bit of a kudos here. He's a computer scientist, by the way. And uh, he was really pushing on just say, I want you guys to do this. And, and actually just, just to, to the rain and just say, okay, let's do it. And uh, he's really the brain behind everything that we've been doing. And then you see a lot of pictures as well uh, of some of the talks that were given. And you could see the, at the bottom, in the middle of the, uh, the bottom there, that's one of the events where we had this large number of people on the Zoom that, really, uh, that, that participated in the, in the event. And uh, this is another glimpse of the one from February, 20, uh, 20, uh, February 24. On the, and uh, again, just to show you how we are making progress. And this is Hashida's son there, who is really helping us out. <laughs> I was out like that. Yeah, right. You know. And it was very, very helpful. You know, please thank, thank him for us, you know. And uh, this is another snapshot of the one that we had in October 18. Uh, and, and, and I think I'm just going to flash that through. And I think I'm going to hand over to Ashita to introduce our guest speaker. Yeah, okay, so, I, I now. So, so one thing, uh, thank you, uh, Wale. So it's been a team effort. So all these seminars are being archived in YouTube including the one uh, we are having today. Uh, and you can watch, so ACM Baltimore cha chapter, I mean, ACM headquarters has put it up, ACM YouTube. And we can do that same for IEEE as well. Uh, maybe in IEEE TV, we can put all of these. Um, so with that, uh, now uh, we have our uh, speaker, Dr. Tafik Hashan, and I'd like to invite um, uh, my colleague, Carol Carey, uh, who, uh, uh, has been a volunteer leader for IEEE Baltimore chapter, and uh, she has a uh, graduation from Johns Hopkins University, had 30 years of experience in FDA, uh, and she has been the main person behind this seminar, and it's been a pleasure collaborating with uh, Carol. Uh, Carol, it's, uh, it's up to you. Thank, Thanks. thank you, Ashutosh. Really, first of all, I really want to thank uh, Ashutosh, Wally, and his team. This is our first collaboration, and I think that this is just the beginning and we're going to do more. So we're very fortunate to actually, uh, you know, collaborate with ACM. And I believe that Ashutas is also a, a very well-known and inf infamous volunteer member in IEEE, being future direct direction future directions chair future networks future future, future networks <laughs> right whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you again so much for all for all this. Uh, as I said, I don't have anything special. Uh, slides or anything like that to show, but uh, are you all IEEE members here? Who's not an IEEE member? Okay, only one. Well, you're going to be a member, I hope. Um, and um, who are uh, who are EMB members here? A couple, a couple. Okay. So anyway, this is brought to you by the EMB uh, chapter of the Baltimore section and ACM. Um, Without further ado, we, we want to introduce our speaker, but I'm going to skip all, the, all his titles and everything because he, he, I've asked our speaker, Tofik Hassan, to actually share his journey from his, you know, being a student graduation, being a researcher, 
publisher, innovator, inventor, and everything else. So all I'm going to say is that Dr. Hassan, welcome. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to speak today. And uh, he is connected with, he's an associate professor at Bangladesh University Engineering and Technology, as well as the uh, director of the MHELP Group Research, and also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University in the main campus of the biomedical engineering team. With further ado, please welcome Dr. Hassan. <clears throat> thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction, Carol. I'm really happy. I'm really happy to be here. So I will uh, just share my slides here. Yeah, I can't do anything until he shares the slides. Uh, and I was hoping to focus the camera on you. Is that possible? I... <clears throat> so I hope this is fine. Okay. Um, Good evening, everyone. I'm really happy that you are here uh, in your busy schedule attending this presentation. So you already have seen the title. So uh, it's basically we have been working on chest X-ray image analysis. And I, I want to share a few sub problems that we've been working on and uh, suggested solutions that uh, we have published. So I think uh, my background is already uh, mentioned nicely by uh, Carol already mentioned. Uh, so I will still uh, give an introduction of myself as, as Carol mentioned. So this is the brief outline. So um, the first half, like the, it's gonna be a bit informal. I hope you like it. Um, and the second part would be like more like going into details of the methods. So um, those are based on actually three, uh, two of them are already published uh, journals and one of them is uh, a thesis work done by my students. So maybe uh, it will be nice if you, I will refer to you the papers, um, but I will try to go uh, through them in an overview way. So let's begin. So um, I work at the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, this BUET. Uh, it's just the top engineering school in the country uh, because we basically are very selective in the admission process. We, are, we like to brag about that. Um, and uh, well, for, for many developing countries, as you know, like our top talents are usually you know, graduating and leaving the country. So I, I actually tried to do the opposite. So, so here's my transition. So I, I graduated from the same university. I was an electrical engineer uh, by training. And then I did my PhD on audio and speech processing, basically. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you may know my advisor, Professor John Hansen at UT Dallas. Uh, he, he's also an IEEE fellow. Uh, and then I worked in the industry for Bosch in, in California for a while. So, and then at that time, I, for different reasons, um, one of them, my, ha my having some intention of doing something in my country, and also some family reasons, I went back. And recently, I, I also started as an adjunct faculty at Hopkins. So it looks nice as a biography, but um, this actually gives a better picture how the transition looks like. So you can see uh, on the left side, during my PhD, I have some photo having burgers with my professor. And, uh, and here's uh, Bosch, where, where I worked. This is their German office. I used to do a lot of international travel. But then when I came back, it's a new department. We had to build everything from scratch. So here's me standing beside the first wall in the department because uh, the university just gave us big, big rooms. We had to build walls and then, uh, you know, buy the computers. Even we had to all, all sometimes decide where the power outlet should go and, and really had to supervise 
these construction workers. So this is my lab being built up uh, in 2016. Uh, this is how it looks uh, now, or this is from 2019. So now, uh, I mean, we have like lamb Lambda uh, cluster computer now, at least a couple of them. So uh, we, we have decent compute power, but not maybe as great as you guys, but so this is the, my lab. So the M Health lab, uh, Carol just mentioned. So we've been working on innovation and R&D, lots of different things, but because I had the audio and speech background, so I naturally wanted to transition into uh, medical image analysis and of course medical signals. So, so the journey starts like before COVID, it was 2019. So I realized, okay, let's work on images and COPD, lung diseases. Uh, these seem to be very important and, and lots of, uh, you know, the huge prevalence. So, and also I talked to some radiologists and others and looked at the statistic. It seems like globally, there's really not enough radiologists to go around and, and some people tell me in Bangladesh, it's a country with 160 million people, uh, sorry, 16, uh, 160 million people, almost 170 now, just 700 registered radiologists serving the whole country. Uh, maybe the number is too low, but maybe there are more phantom radiologists out there, but, <laughs> but it, it's really, I mean, I looked at the numbers, I was like, okay, this is a good area. So we, um, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, x-rays mostly used the most uh, commonly used medical imaging uh, modality, lung diseases, you know, respiratory diseases, high, uh, you know, prevalence, let's work on this. Um, and, uh, you know, AI seems to be a good solution because, you know, let's say I, I know radiologists who are looking at more than 100 CT scan images every day in Bangladesh. Um, so maybe if we can make their life a little easier. Um, I know like some scientists mentioned that replacing radiologists, so I'm not getting into that. So that's a separate discussion. So um, that was the motivation. So this is kind of my introduction of the AI work when we started uh, in 2019. So AI should be beneficial. And of course, I just want to you know, mention there are lots of other ways AI is being used in medical imaging, except, you know, it's X-ray and beyond. So even MRI reconstruction, sometimes organ segmentation, even report generation, but then, unfortunately, um, COVID happened. So we were struck by that like everybody else. And um, well, uh, many of us may have lo uh, lost their loved ones and uh, you know, we feel sorry for that. And, but at the same time, you had to adjust everything, right? So it's like working from home remotely. You know, we had to set up everything in Bangladesh, like you know, remote uh, working online classes and all that. And also, you know, it seemed like because it's a healthcare crisis, we are biomedical engineering department. We felt like we should do something, right? So it seemed like there might be things, problems to solve. However, of course, it's highly risky time. So immediately we, we, we looked at two different angles. Of course, I had this AI, you know, background. So I wanted to also do AI assisted screening. So that was the part two, but really what doctors were telling me, like we need ventilators, people are dying, oxygen and all that in Bangladesh, you know, the situation was even worse, like in compared to the developing countries, developed countries. Uh, so this seemed to be more urgent. This is uh, some pictures during my during COVID times. So we developed uh, a low cost CPAP ventilator at that time. Um, it's like locally made and you know, it's an innovative device. We finally US, uh, we did the US patent on it recently, uh, trying to commercialize it. But at that time we were running around and that's me on the left side, uh, wearing full gown PPE, uh, testing on a COVID patient in the hospital, uh, testing if the CPAP is, you know, you know, if what the CPAP, what it does is it gives you positive pressure on your lungs. So we needed to test if, if the lungs have positive pressure or not. So. We needed an engineer there, so uh, I didn't send my students there. <laughs> so, but yeah, that was scary times. And this is me trying out another innovation. This is also went through clinical trials. So we, we did multiple clinical trials on both of the devices. Uh, this is my desk while I was trying to do hundreds of things. But in the end, this project seemed to be like the most significant project that I have done so far. 
uh, we, you know, we had a lot of impact, a lot of uh, coverage. Uh, BBC covered it, Voice of America, all the national media, and also it was featured on a UN publication. We won several prizes. And this is actually the project that enabled me to become an adjunct at Hopkins. That's how they, you know, uh, recognized me because they really liked the idea. And then now we are still working together or trying to work on innovative stuff together. But this talk is not about, uh, you know, COVID works on medical devices. So let's go back to X-ray images. So we were still actually trying this while during COVID. So um, I will go through this uh, story to kind of formulate how we came up with these problems that we are going to discuss. So um, it seemed like there were data sets coming out during that time, 2020, uh, 2019. So maybe a few hundred samples. So you can see like some of the papers, they have like really high number of citations now. Uh, it seemed like, uh, you know, very, I sometimes think about we should have, should have worked on that or not. But at that time, what happened, we realized like people are releasing some data coming out from different hospitals, putting together a data set. Um, the positive examples coming from different hospitals worldwide, some COVID patients, and people are collecting like normal x-rays uh, from previous, uh, you know, data sets like pre-pandemic, and then putting together and then doing binary classification. And most papers reported like 95, 99, 100% accuracy, using like, you know, traditional models modified uh, in different architectures. And we were saying, hey, wait a minute. It's, you know, we know the bias variance trade-off in machine learning. So if we have highly complex models, um, you know, if you have less amount of data, what would happen? It, it's probably overfitting. So it's like the, the, the accuracies are very high. So we were a bit skeptical. And we actually talked to the radiologists, the doctors. So just to give a context, during COVID, and even now, uh, there's not much uh, digital imaging going on. Like there are, you know, with most places, but they print out, you know, they print the image like on film and then they give to the patient. That's kind of the norm. Uh, in some hospitals, they have full, you know, DICOM and all the, you know, electronic health record and stuff. So, and they were doing CT scan images, mostly to do like how much the lung is involved with the infection. And um, of course, uh, doctors may look, up, look at the x-ray to do, make some decision. But interestingly, the doctor would say, we don't need AI, you know. Well, with the x-ray, we just look at it and we know it's, it's COVID. We don't really need AI. So we were like saying, okay, and then what do you need then? It's like, so one of the needs they mentioned was like, we need online reporting, like you send the image in. We, we did that as a side project. Uh, and also uh, they were suggesting analyzing CT images. Uh, so because they were having to go through all the CT image slides and and then annotating uh, the infected regions, it took a lot of time. So that's something we tried. But since we're gonna talk about more like X-ray imaging, so I will not go into those. And then actually later on some problems came out with the data sets. These were published actually later in 2021, like, um, you know, because the data is coming from two different domains. Now I'm gonna introduce the word term domain. I think many of you already know uh, that they're coming from, let's say some hospitals in China, and then the healthy images are coming from, let's say US, some previous uh, data sets. So there's obviously the, the situation where the machine learning model tries to learn, uh, you know, the other you know, aspects of some artifacts of the image and, and become biased. So several papers came out on this issue so you can see like the model bias issue and uh, this paper also the external validation because most of the papers that were coming out at that time, uh, they were not really validating the model on external data. So it's just, you have the, this data set, you do like maybe a five fold cross validation or tenfold, something like that. So then there was an interesting question posed in this paper. So what if you took the data and, and cut out the lungs, you know, you should not be able to tell if the person has COVID or not, right? But it seemed, this paper showed that uh, in these data sets, if you train the model and test the, in the same data set, in some of these cases, some of these networks, their performance is still 80%. So you can, you can tell if somebody has COVID by looking at their shoulders, you know, <laughs> it seems like that. Um, but if you train the model, you know, pre-trained it on like a bigger data set and then adapt it to this model, this data, then those, those models performance significantly drop, right? Because 
and obviously it's it's really trying to detect the disease. So here we actually are getting into something like, okay, there are some issues here. You have to look at the lungs, right? You should not look at things outside the interest area, right? So three challenges we kind of identified through this exercise. We didn't get to work on all of them during um, the uh, COVID time, of course. So one is domain variability, like the images can change because of other reasons than the disease, right? Because of different hospitals, different machines, or you know, just different demographics, those things. Anatomy awareness, which is a term we we're in, we try to introduce, I, I guess we tried, we introduced this first, I would like to say that, but I think the term is not there. I mean, now there, I mean, in other, other papers. So that's, of course, you can see what, what it means is basically the model knows about the anatomy. And the third one is image superimposition, which is related uh, to anatomy awareness, because it's, I will go into that in the details when I go into three parts. So basically it's an X-ray image, uh, you know, it, it's additive imaging, right? You're, it's, you're combining your anatomical parts together in, in a 2D, it's a 3D image becoming two dimensions. So that's the superimposition. So we tried to work on these three problems and we published already the two works. The third one is kind of going on. So now I'm gonna dive into the three problems and hopefully try to uh, give you some insight of the solutions that we propose. So first, domain variability problem. So um, as I just mentioned, the images can have variability, not only because of the diseases, right? That's what you ideally hope for. Like the only thing that is changed in the image because the, the person has a disease or not, or uh, you know, they have a cardiomegaly versus uh, you know, a lung consolidation. But unfortunately, there are different reasons like acquisition sites, like uh, demographic dis discrepancies, um, all the other things, like sometimes you have a markers on the image, there's like small letters written on top and then, so those things, uh, you know, can cause a problem. So in the COVID-19 case, uh, of course, the positive COVID patients data maybe were collected from different hospitals or maybe one hospital, there's majority of them, and the healthy subjects are maybe data collecting from uh, previous uh, data sets, as I mentioned. So here are some of the examples, let's say, you know, say you have some contrast difference here, some settings are different, um, I'm not an expert on the, the hardware of the x-ray, so. And this is like, for example, this is pediatric pneumonia. This is something that we are working on now. Um, so say medical devices, there actually have been some public published results where uh, it, it was shown that um, when, when the machine learning models see that there is, let's say, a pacemaker on the image, it is more likely to predict that the person has cardiac disease. Although it, it's, there is a correlation, of course, but I mean, as a radiologist, uh, you know, you would always, I mean, as, as an expert radiologist will always diagnose based on the features of the disease, not an existence of a device. So here you can see some markers there. So, so this is like what happens when you have this problem in, in a domain mismatch, let's say in different classes, right? So let's say, you know, you have a model like this and in your, in your training data, uh, you have, let's say, so the, there are like some elderly people there and then you have younger people on the, uh, you know, the, the positive example. So you have a model trained like this, but model two is trained like this, which seems to be more accurate because when you have an external validation set, actually your data should be lying there. So this is uh, kind of like the case that we're dealing with in the pediatric pneumonia case where you have an age variation and we don't have enough samples for the pediatric pneumonia case. So this is how it's gonna impact. But there are other ways, like even if you have, you know, uh, you know, the same domain in the training, but you have to test in a completely different domain. Uh, that's another problem we're facing when we try to deploy something in Bangladesh. Let's say that all the data is coming from US. Let's say we have the NIH data, the MIMIC data, and then there's the Stanford data. But when we try to test them, you know, in Bangladesh, where it has like this differences, right? So that's why, you know, we try to solve the problem. But now, you know, like there are two ways, like you can adapt, do domain adaptation, and do domain generalization, right? So adaptation, it would be like, you need some samples of the target domain. So you wanna do some small testing or fine tuning. Uh, but in domain generalization, uh, it's, it's more superior if you can solve the problem, like your model becomes uh, generalizable. So basically it works on any unseen domain, hopefully. 
so here's kind of uh, you know a figure basically and so you have two different domains but within the domain you have different classes right so in in adaptation you kind of see a little bit of the target domain and then you try to learn a joint subspace where you can uh, differentiate between different domains but we really want to do unseen target domains like i don't even know what the test data would look like so how, how can we solve that problem so the idea came like there was like you know, this huge thing I mean, some, some years back I and mean, now generative ai has gone way forward uh, at that time it was seemed quite cool like you had different styles right you can paint in the style of van gogh and uh, you know, something like that so you can change the style so we were thinking can we uh, think of this domain mismatch problem in the context of style so uh, we did some small experiments like for example it seemed like cnn models are biased uh, more towards the style attribute so let's say here you can see um, you have an x-ray image in cardiomegaly it's enlargement of the heart that's the abnormality so if you kind of perturbate it using, uh, this is basically simple style change, like just contrast and uh, you know, uh, uh, brightness. What happens is uh, visually humans can still distinguish. We can see the features, right? And here also uh, the, the, you know, an expert radiologist can still identify the abnormality. Uh, but what happens if you, you know, train a model, the confidence scores are going down, right? So that actually means, you know, this is kind of a demonstration, but it's, there's also a published study that shows like CNN models are more biased towards uh, the style. So what we're thinking of like, okay, so we want to propose uh, a, uh, you know, uh, like a domain generalization technique where we will generate different styles to make the model more robust. And our assumption is basically now the image content is basically representing the pathology that what we are after and the style is kind of representing the domain. I mean, of course you can argue against it, but this is kind of the assumption that we are trying to make here. And so basically in this case, uh, you know, if there's some uh, like abnormality in the lung, that's the content that we're after, but not this kind of like a device, uh, you know, in the X-ray, like a cardio, uh, the, the pacemaker. So we tested this like in initially, let's say we had three data sets. Uh, these are huge data sets, each of them. Uh, I think uh, they have more than 100, 200,000 samples. The Brax data is smaller, like 40,000. So if you look at the, it is just simple. It's the, you know, the brightness, the intensity of the pixels, mean and standard deviations. You can see uh, there, you can actually classify the databases kind, kind of, I mean, roughly. You can see like there's maybe overlap here, uh, but you know, the Brax data is like all over the place. And if you look at uh, like a baseline model and you look at the, you know, the TSNE component one uh, from uh, the higher uh, dimensional features, you can clearly kind of distinguish the data sets from the features, which is not a good thing. You don't want to be able to distinguish the data set. So we, we aim to develop a, uh, a model that is, that is aiming to extract style invariant features and content bias. So the model should be biased towards the uh, the features of the pathology and not towards the style and and uh, and also uh, do this explicitly within within the the model and we've uh, i don't want to go into the literature but we have some we compared it with a lot of uh, existing works uh, but we haven't found a paper that is doing it in, in explicitly like we are doing so this is kind of the proposed architecture so um, it's basically based on a dense net uh, incident model and but we have like you can see like uh, two streams like now uh, in in the uh, in the first uh, you can see we have this uh, image and feature level randomization module so the image gets randomized uh, so basically you have a stylized randomized uh, in the training batch so basically we are doing it we did something simple there like uh, the mean and variance of the entire image it's randomly shifting between uh, the entire range that's possible within the data set. So basically you have this now randomization here. And then uh, we, uh, we have also in the feature level after dense block, block two, we also do a feature level and randomization. But uh, the idea is that the radiologist, you know, even if you change the style, he can still recognize, right? Uh, what the pathology is. So the, the first loss here, the regularization loss, is going to try 
to minimize like you know after learning you know these global feature maps should be more or less similar even though you have perturbed the style right so that is the main idea here and another thing we try to uh, do here um, is in the, you know, in the classification scores. So you have, this is a multi-label data set. So you have, let's say, maybe sometimes 14 classes or eight classes. So the probability scores, we did uh, kullback libera divergence measures. That's another loss in there. And then of course the classification loss. So I don't wanna go into too much details. Uh, we have you, the, the journal paper, you can uh, hopefully take a look. So based on these three uh, losses and uh, we developed the model and uh, we basically use these three data sets. These are again, large scale data sets. And we've already shown like they have some domain mismatch, right? And uh, we want to keep the Brax data uh, as a separate unseen domain test set. So here are the results and these are all the methods that we compared with. These are all we implemented ourselves and these methods uh, have uh, some domain adaptation or generalization methods implemented. So we compared with them. And uh, in this experiment, we have training done on Chexpert and Mimic data and uh, testing was done on the Brax data, which is completely um, uh, unseen. So you can see the results for a couple of diseases, we are not getting uh, the best results, but mostly uh, we are getting uh, better results. And then basically we, uh, we did a statistical significance test. Uh, I, I believe it was five full cause validation. Um, so this, this seemed encouraging. And then also we've done experiments uh, with single source. So this was previous one is multi-source. So we have in training, we have both data sets. And then but testing, we just have uh, the Brax data. We always keep the Brax data as unseen tests. It was never seen by the model during training. And also um, when we did like single source domain generalization, we still uh, got pretty good results on average. Uh, they were um, superior compared to the baselines. And then um, we did another analysis uh, where uh, this was from another paper which suggested that um, papers, uh, sorry, sorry, the paper suggested that if you look at the low pass filter version of an image, that is more representative of the domain or the, the style of the image. And, uh, and we also, you know, based on that uh, evaluation, we, we also did this low pass filtered version and then we changed the, the cutoff frequency of this low pass filtering. And uh, we compared the model's performance on the, you know, basically more blurry image version. So the idea is that uh, the, the lower uh, frequency uh, components of the image uh, has more of the, the domain uh, related information. So here's the result on that. And the ablation study uh, on different components, we have the different losses and uh, style randomization module, uh, the image level and the feature level. So we've done all the experiments to see the components and how they're contributing to the results. And finally, again, uh, we've looked at the TSNE visualization. So again, um, ideally these should be mixed up because they are coming from two different domains. So this is not uh, healthy versus normal class. This is they're all positive examples. They're all disease class, but the colors represent different domains or different data sets. So the baseline models are like this. That means they're kind of still separable. And our proposed uh, model is kind of making them more indistinguishable. So that is the idea that domains should not be distinguishable from the final features. The, fe the final features should be more dependent on the content or the pathology. So uh, then this is the conclusions from part one. Basically, we've uh, developed this model with style randomization framework, and it, it seemed to be working on this uh, three data sets that we've used. These are all large scale data sets. Um, and uh, one of the data set was always kept as unseen. Uh, and of course, um, there are several ways we can uh, continue the work on more expanded data sets. And so um, this kind of concludes the part one. Now um, I'm gonna talk about the part two, which is uh, anatomy awareness problem. So I gave a hint on this, oh, sorry. Okay, I guess that's, is, is that normal, right? Oh, okay. So um, again, comparing like traditional 
methods like of uh, image classification or computer vision. So this is what we've seen like during, into, uh, this work is a bit older, like we started in 2020 or 2021, something like that, late 2020. So at that time we were seeing like most uh, of the work on X-ray imaging, they were basically, uh, you know, taking models trained on ImageNet and other such something, some method is working well on ImageNet. So they are kind of adapting it to the X-ray imaging. So, but our hunch was like, wait, the uh, traditional images like in the cats and dogs or cars in the image net, they don't really have their uh, you know area of interest always in the you know in a certain region an x-ray image is more like structured right so a lung disease should not come in the shoulder right we've talked about that and so how do we um, make the models more aware of that there's this is the human anatomy so can we do that so there are actually more work now right now in this area but at that time we didn't find enough so again, uh, I always tell my students to either talk to the radiologist or read their books, um, I mean, whichever domain they're working on. So I try to get them involved with the medical professionals. So we talked to them, so like they said, hey, we actually first identify, you know, where, where are the lungs, where's the mediastinum, you know, where are the rib cage, and, and then we actually look for the anomalies. I mean, we don't, I mean, because I have a prior, I mean, the radiologists, they have a prior knowledge of how the body looks like. And then they kind of, uh, you know, decide. But sometimes you have also it's coming, uh, you know, the third problem is also showing up here. So you have overlapping structures. So how, how do you know if this is, you know, a consolidation or something, you know, over the heart or how do you know that? It's because of they have the experience, right? But in this work, we didn't go to the superimposition problem. We just realized that the anatomy should be kind of made known to the model uh, more explicitly. That should be more effective. So there were like some previous work at that time, not too many, but they were kind of using segmentation. Uh, sometimes they would just crop out the lungs and then feed the model with just the lungs. And then that didn't seem to be intuitive to us also because the radiologist would say like, sometimes they also look at outside the lungs or, you know, surrounding regions. And also, you know, you're losing some information, you know, around the edges, sometimes you're the major major problem is the segmentation doesn't always work. I mean, you train on some data and then you just apply the segmentation, but uh, there are not too many uh, data sets with segmentation uh, labels, the, the masks. So for, for this, there was another method where they were using the green channel uh, to send the anatomy information. And then you could also directly multiply uh, the image with the, the pixels of the anatomical sites. So we thought, it, we could do something better in this domain. So um, what we what we saw, like you know, these methods they don't have really like a weighting mechanism, right? So for example, uh, how how does the model know that the cardiomegaly or the enlargement of the heart is related to the heart, not the lungs, right? And um, and also the other challenge is, of course, as I mentioned, the less availability of these uh, segmentation data sets. How do we solve that problem? Um, and then the segmentation masks, they have uh, errors or imperfections. And also there are like other self-attention based methods there don't really necessarily incorporate the anatomy information. So, so we proposed the anatomy X net. This was published in 2022. So afterwards there has probably been more work similar to this and, and more advanced. But at that time, uh, we haven't seen much in similar work. And so it, it actually does several things. One is it makes you know the model aware of the anatomy. In this case, we are talking about the lungs and the heart because we didn't have good segmentation data sets for the other parts like the rib cage and um, so maybe so, so on and so forth. And the other thing is uh, the imperfection masks, how to in, uh, incorporate that. We, uh, we proposed a cycle GAN based uh, semi-supervised approach uh, that, that worked quite well and also it, it it's basically the method is based on attention mechanism and it tries to give relative importance to uh, lungs, hearts and outside area. And it basically learns that from the data and, and, and depending on the disease it might give. So basically the idea is it will give more importance to the heart region if it's the cardiomegaly. So that's the idea. So this is kind of the overall structure. Like, uh, so we have in, in different blocks, we have uh, this uh, segmented information, we kind of uh, give that as attention and 
So basically, uh, the attention module, the, the anatomy of our attention model, the way it works, it has like three streams, the lung, the heart stream, and the residuals, the other, the other parts. So it learns the uh, attention separately, and then combines them in the final calibrated feature space. So you have the lung attention vector and the heart attention vector, uh, and then you have like a weighting mechanism in the, in the feature level and also in the different channel level. Uh, and, and then we have the residual attention level. So this, this was also important. It seemed like if you just focus on these two, um, you know, there are other diseases and other conditions which, you know, might require, you know, the, the, also the, the other thing was in case the masks is not good. So some methods, they were just cropping the lungs, you know, they are missing something, right? If, if there's a mistake. So for that reasons, we also had the residual attention part. So, so this is like the full architecture shown with the numbers and all the details, but it's, it's from the paper. So uh, if you are interested, you can look into the paper. And, and this was actually our uh, cycle GAN based approach where, uh, because we had a limited data set for uh, training the segmentation. So what we did was we trained this uh, cycle GAN architecture for the segmentation mask and it, it kind of worked better uh, with the NIH data set, which we were primarily testing on. So these are like some of the results and it, we, we got quite improved uh, results uh, on, on both, on the three, all three data sets using all the classify, all the diseases. So here are the more details about in, in, in terms of all the different uh, abnormalities. So you can see our method was, at that time it was a state of the art method as, as far as we can, uh, we can tell. Uh, but of course, I mean, by now, the you know, field moves very fast. So there may be new methods uh, like, uh, and also on the, uh, this is a Chexpart, Stanford Chexpart data set. Uh, and, and then uh, here are some examples of how uh, the model is still able to identify like uh, the, the anatomical, the, the abnormal region, even if you have like a, like a mistake in the segmentation. So basically uh, concluding part two, we integrated anatomical information as attention. There could be other ways to do it, but we felt like this is a better way because we don't want to just, you know, have a cropping mechanism or uh, more like uh, brute force mechanisms. And uh, we also proposed this, uh, technique of uh, the, the, uh, the cycle GAN architecture where we uh, generated uh, the uh, segmentation masks uh, for a new data set which doesn't have any labels uh, for, for the segmentation. And we've seen good results on all three data sets. So I will, uh, hopefully I'm on time. Uh, Um, it was kept consistent, like uh, sometimes it's two, 224 by 224 or 512 by 512, depending on, um, because when we are comparing, we made sure that they're all in the same, because we're comparing with other methods. So the only thing I think maybe you've seen here, so most of these methods are actually, uh, so see here we also tried the higher resolution version. So if you look at uh, less lower resolution, so then you can discard the last row here. So in that case, maybe our method is in some diseases not, I mean, it's still like, you know, better than the others. Uh, but so the blue color is the second best here. So if you use like, I, I, I believe others were not using the full 512 at that time. So most of them were using 224 by 224. So we've tried the high, but we didn't use the full resolution. Sometimes some data sets have like maybe 100, you know, 10, uh, 24 by 10, 24, but we didn't uh, most of the time do that. Okay, so the way I understand it then is that um, you fed it the entire picture. The resolution may be different, but the entire picture went in. You didn't cut the picture up into smaller no. pieces and then feed those pieces in. It was one image fed yeah. in. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, it's about, uh, it's an impressive work. Uh, 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 
to first. This is Amrutur Narsiman. Okay. And uh, when you are not able to segment properly, are you able to get good results? Um, yes, I mean, uh, on, well, this is showing you like on average, we are getting better results. And we've also examined few samples where the segmentation model uh, did not you know, give good uh, you know, segmentation masks, but our uh, method were still able to uh, identify the anomalies. I mean, yeah. I, I, I believe there are more examples in the paper, uh, but this is this is the one we have uh, you know, in the slide. So here you can see. So the, the lungs other, should the not following, be like following question is about uh, what kind of deep algorithms that you used uh, in past, uh, during my PhD days, I used unsupervised learning to do some of these things. Uh, I may not be as successful as you are. You guys have done in recent works. This was long back, you know, <laughs> 1980s and things like that, 70s. So, so uh, what kind of deep algorithms are you using here? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. So this is basically a dense net. Uh, mm. So, but you know, if you look at the method, I mean, maybe I'll go back here. So you can have different type of models also, but you can incorporate the same concept. Like basically within uh, the blocks, uh, when we are actually, it's inter interesting to point out. So we are actually giving attention to the feature maps, not mm -hmm. the image. Like we tried that actually in the beginning, like, okay, can we just you know, multiply those pixels, you know, that has the anatomical information or uh, different colors but it seems that you know when we actually our paper has this ablation study like in which block or which uh, you know deeper layer where you should put the attention and we've seen like you know in, in for at least for dense net 121 uh, you know the block three and block four if you do the combination there and then uh, you know give the attention there it, it works best for us so mm -hmm. yes this is the the architecture uh, we use and it's a supervised learning method it's not unsupervised mm -hmm. I think, uh, the, the, as the I think you have asked that question um, and, and it's a multi-class problem. So that means the it's not binary or uh, mm. let's say, sometimes it can be binary, like you have COVID or not, that's binary, but sometimes you have five diseases, right? But this yeah. is multi-class, that means it might be uh, two diseases. Uh, mm. So so it, it, it's, it's, it's a different way of, uh, yeah. So how practical in terms of uh, practicality uh, have you tested this in real world? Um, I don't have the results here, but right now we uh, we have collected like a few thousand samples of pediatric pneumonia uh, oh, okay. patients. So we are. Uh, I could show you the results. I have it somewhere in my laptop. If you're really interested, it's okay. In no, you don't have to go uh, ahead. It, it, I'll say from your talk, but you can yeah. explain what you have done that makes it very practical. So, so sorry, is that, a, you want to ask me, you're asking I me. Mean, uh, you have tested in a practical environment that uh, that your algorithms are successful? Yes, we are We are currently doing that. Okay. Because in Bangladesh, what, I mean, at least our target is applying this in Bangladesh. Uh, we have a, I have a small, uh, you know, spin-off. Hmm. Uh, I, I wouldn't call it a spin-off yet. I just have one student trying to do that work, but we have like a, web app software where you know you have these models so we are trying that but the problem is in bangladesh uh, data collection is a challenge as i mentioned they have a lot of film based imaging mm. not a lot of dicom images and those ones who have it they don't want to give it uh, you know for research because it's corporate hospitals and they don't i'm sorry i them. joined you a little late so i'm uh, i just got the information just now so uh, you know, uh, I, I would be interested in knowing more things, what you do. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think uh, you said that the predicted uh, masks were outputted by a cycle GAN. Is there a reason why you chose to go with a cycle GAN approach instead of um, like a supervised you have a data set with the masks and um yes so what what we did was um because 
um, there's a domain mismatch between, so we use the JSRT data. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So it's maybe 200, 300 samples. They have the you know ground truth masks, but uh, we are applying it on NIH data, which is like 200,000 images. Uh, so we use that, uh, basically we generated some, so what we did was it's semi-supervised, right? We, we trained a supervised model and then we, uh, you know, evaluated that on some of the NIH data and we found some of the good ones. And then we, we used the cycle again because, you know, uh, it, it does, uh, you know, as you know, like it's doing both, like it's generating the image from the uh, mask and also mask from the image and it trying to make consistency between. So that's how we were able to, you know, make it work on the unseen NIH data without labels. Okay. Thank you. Have you done anything with overlaying the anterior and the posterior x-rays to provide additional information or do you treat each x-ray separately? That's a very good question. So because only the Stanford Chexpert data set has these separate information as far as I can recall, they have also the lateral view uh, of the same patient. But our, our other data sets don't have that. They're always our, our AP or PA. So that's why we all only looked at the you know frontal ones, either AP or PA. But but that's a good good question. I mean, uh, we that should be explored. One follow up to that: Have you, when you're doing the anatomy um, identification with your masking, have you thought about taking out the hard structures like the ribs to see if it yields any additional data? I mean, if you had both the anterior and posterior, you could probably do a little bit of addition to the data set, but. Yeah, I think I, I will cover, I mean, not exactly that, but we did in the third part, uh, we did some, uh, you know, this overlapping part, right? You're talking about like, sometimes, you know, in the x-ray image, you can see the, this heart here, but the lungs is overlapping, right? So if you just cut out the heart, you're actually cutting out parts of the lungs as well. So that's actually, that's not a good strategy. If, because some of the baseline methods we compared with, they're actually doing that. Uh, and even you know, the best segmentation algorithm is going to just cut right, right here. It's not going to understand that there's lungs over this, right? So, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what kind of computational techniques do you use for training or inference? Um, sorry? Computational techniques, hardware and software parallelization, speed up, and how do you okay. handle so much data? So uh, as, as I mentioned, we, we were lucky enough with some of our alumni, they donated us with uh, like a quad GPU cluster, like uh, like four, four GPUs. I think they have uh, 12 GB uh, memory, and then now we have another one, so we have two. So the latest one we have, they have 20 GB uh, memory graphics card, four of them in one cluster, so it's, I mean, it's the Lambda, I mean, you know the Lambda Labs, right? This is a company, they, they make these machines. So we have just two of these. I think Hopkins Labs, they have one for every student. I have went to uh, the, the lab of Professor Rama Chal Chalepa. So, but yeah, that's the hardware we're using. And for software, we're mostly using a PyTorch. So a PyTorch, I mean, it, it has the, all the parallelization, everything inside, uh, as, as, much as, I, um, as much as I know. But you know, I'd like to just mention. I mean, this, these works are done by really hardworking students, and mm. you know, if you really want to go into more details of implementation, I will have to ask them to maybe. <laughs> it's four a.m. in Bangladesh, so otherwise, uh, <laughs> maybe some of them are here. I don't know. <laughs> so this is uh, Amritur Narsimhan again. I was just wondering when you cut off the heart or something like that uh, in your uh, segmentation or uh, of the image, uh, are you really trying to just isolate only the lungs or you're trying to find faults in both the heart as well as the lungs? Uh, no, we are not, uh, uh, sorry, uh, if I understand your question correctly, we are not cutting out the lungs or the heart. We are using that information to design uh, an attention mechanism that will provide more attention to different regions uh, that's again, it's within the training. It will be based on uh, the ground truth. 
Yeah, but the 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 kinds of things that you need to do for heart quite may be different because it is dynamic as opposed to lungs, uh, which are a little bit less dynamic, I guess, <laughs> to put it in. Uh, uh, I mean, in the X-ray, I don't think nothing is moving in the X-ray. So <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure what you mean by dynamic, but. <laughs> no, in the heart ways, uh, are you taking the animation of the no, 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 X-rays no. or just the only one uh, X-ray? Just one, yeah. Just one? Yes. Wow. Okay, but uh, did did you do you plan to take a dynamic view of the things so that you can probably with your algorithms uh, identify more problems with heart? Yeah, that would probably need um, different kind of imaging. Mm -hmm. right? Not only imaging, not, but not uh, not your algorithms should be able to detect problems in heart right that's more relevant in the health industry than the lungs of course lungs are also important <laughs> yes. so um i think uh, if maybe one more question and then i need to uh, i have another interesting part to present so any other question over there uh, i have a question I, I just want a little clarification. So you said you're doing supervised learning with the cycle GANs. Generally, they're used for unsupervised. So I was wondering, do you mean the supervised learning is more for your attention mechanism or the cycle GANs matching the two sets? It's for generating the segmentation masks from the NIH data, which doesn't have any masks. Okay. So that's why. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, First of all, thank you, Dr. Hassan, for the wonderful presentation. You didn't mention AI. You know, AI is being used everywhere, but AI is an umbrella term. So I was just, I'm particularly interested in to see what kind of uh, AI methodology, whether it's a deep learning, artificial neural network, decision tree. Uh, I was wondering if you know, like, what kind of algorithms uh, and what methodology of artificial intelligence you use for the chess, uh, this, uh, screening and this filtering and developing your models? Um, I think, as I mentioned, this is a deep learning architecture, the DenseNet 121. Uh, there are many other architectures like, you know, residual net and efficient net. So these are all deep, I mean, they are CNN based, like convolutional neural net based. Uh, but, you know, they, they are, these are benchmark models and we are, we, this is like a modified version of that and, uh, and you can, you know, incorporate such methodology within other similar architectures. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes this is an artificial, you know, I mean, that was a term I think used more in the 80s and then there was like AI winter and people started, you know, like Jeffrey Hinton's new paper came out, they'd kind of say, okay, this is deep learning. It's like, you know, this is different thing, but actually the same thing, but rebranding, right? But now it's picked off and sometimes so, Okay, I really want to go to the third part because it's very interesting and it's not published yet. So hopefully, you know, this is okay. It's just that my students just defended the thesis. Um, so um, when we identified the anatomy, uh, like awareness issue, uh, we realized, okay, even if we do the segmentation, as I just mentioned, the lungs is still over the heart, right? And the rib cages are still here. Like, so the, you can see the bones. So uh, what can we do about that? So basically this is happening because it's an, because of the X-ray imaging mechanism, right? It is not like how we see the world. We are looking at reflected light. Like if you take a photograph, it's a reflected light photography, right? But this is projection radiography, it's a projection imaging. In real world, we, we don't know how this looks like, right? Unless, you know, we're Superman, right? So this is maybe, <laughs> <laughs> so these these are actually real creatures. I didn't. I just googled them up. So some some animals in uh, we have there. They kind of have transparent bodies. You can see their, you know, anatomy. Like when you look at them. Uh, but this is the closest I could find for humans. But really, I mean, imagine like when you look at me, you can look at all my organs and my bones and everything, because light is just going through me. Um, 
So that is not what happens when you know, we're looking at images or we're taking pictures with our smartphones and all the models that we are working on, their computer vision, mostly, again, going from ImageNet and other big data sets. What really I see happening is, you know, computer science, uh, you know, field, they invent new, uh, you know, models and methods that works on these benchmark data sets. And then uh, we in the biomedical sector usually have adapted version of those, and modify them. So we were trying to say, okay, can, can we take a step back? So what can we do about this issue, like lungs being overlapped? So the idea is, what if we can just take out the lungs? And this is very interesting because when we showed this email, I mean, I'm kind of going, jumping forward. We did this, right? How we did this, I'm gonna tell you. So this is actually an X-ray of just the lungs, right? So if you dissected the human body and took out the lungs and put it in the X-ray machine, this is how it should look like. Now, when we showed this to the radiologists, they were like freaked out. Like we have never seen uh, an image like, what the hell is this? I mean, so uh, what we are trying to do is just separate out the lung tissue from this mixed image where you have overlapped bones and you have the heart and everything is overlapped. So the idea is to do that. And we've not seen any papers that has done that, but uh, it seemed like some startup is doing that, but they didn't open up their method. So uh, the idea is that, okay, we did segmentation, we did anatomy awareness, like now how can we, uh, you know, go a bit further because this is now projection image with this image superimposition. So this is what I call the superimposition problem, right? This is, that's how it's known as. So um, in the literature, we have seen like um, some methods that were doing like dual energy x-rays that try to do bone suppression and uh, there are similar methods, but you know, dual energy X-rays means you need a different type of X-ray imaging uh, equipment that has like two different uh, X-ray beams thrown at the body. So, um, and also there are like from CT images, uh, we've seen some somebody doing similar work, uh, but this is all mostly on the the uh, the uh, the, uh, the partial bone region. Uh, so, this is for mo mostly for musculoskeletal structures, but. Uh, not that not the domain that we were targeting. So this is the one that they were like doing something. There was a startup company that was doing that. And I actually found out after visiting Hopkins that somebody told me like, you can check this out, but there's no method published there, how to, how they did that. So the way we uh, solve this problem, we, the idea is we have uh, CT scan images, so we can generate synthetic X-ray and then synthetic lung X-ray. And then again, we have uh, a generative adversarial architecture to kind of predict what the lungs might look like. So we need all these data sets. So we have uh, Luna 16 data sets, so CT volume image, it's a big data set. And then the VIN uh, DR uh, X-ray data set. Uh, and, and so these unpaired data, which means we don't have the ground truth for them. We don't know how the lungs would look. Actually, for any X-ray, if it's an actual X-ray of a human being, we don't know how the lungs would look like, you know, because we never can get the ground truth unless we, <laughs> we actually take out the lungs and do the X-ray. So that's not possible, right? And then we also have the COVID uh, X-ray data set there. So first generating the syn synthetic X-ray, this is coming from this paper that proposed this method, because if you just, uh, you know, from a physics perspective, it's basically, you know, you're, you have um, um, basically, um, is attenuation coefficient, you know, like if you have studied the physics of the, uh, you know, the X-ray imaging. So, but now you have variable uh, attenuation coefficients coming on, you just put them together and you have the image, but that in that way, the images don't really look like actual X-rays. So this method was proposed, some nonlinear transformation and then projection combining. So that's how we generate the synthetic X-ray. Um, and uh, also we've seen like, uh, these, these are distribution mismatches, histogram uh, from actual X-rays and um, real X-rays. So we did some work on that, some image processing. Um, here also, um, so here is actually some of the synthetic lungs that we now generated. So basically now we have the CT scan data, which is marked where the lung is. It's a volume, right? Uh, and we develop the method or it's already published how to generate the synthetic x-ray when you have the CT scan. Now we can just take out the lungs in the CT scan. We can do that because 
you know, there's nothing, no harm done to the subject, right? So it's in the CT scan. And then we do the exact same projection to get just the lungs, how it should have looked like if every other organ was removed. So this is how this ghostly lung image looks like, which our radiologists were initially confused about. So um, for the training, we, uh, we did some data augmentation and uh, this is more details from the, from the lunar data set and then uh, also the wind big deer. Uh, the, the wind, so basically we still need the actual X-ray because you know, uh, the model, if it's only trained on the synthetic, uh, it doesn't really work on the real X-ray. So we had to do something like the generative adversarial network here. So uh, this is again the deep distribution of the data set and how we, uh, so this is the network. So basically it's a unit structure. So, uh, but before uh, in the last layer, what we have like a gradient reversal layer, which is actually doing domain classification. So basically we have uh, two inputs, right? So that's the, one is the synthetic X-ray, one is the uh, actual X-ray for which we don't know how the lungs would look like. So domain classifier will actually try to classify which one it is. But then we have a reversal rail. So basically it's telling it to not be able to distinguish these two things. So the idea is the unit, the last layer feature should be very similar from both type of images. And then when we generate the lungs image based on the ground truth, it should work uh, as well as, you know, for both type of inputs, that's the idea. And then we have the, the classical GAN architecture where, you know, the, is it a real lungs or a fake lungs? So we have a discriminator and the, you know, generator. So, uh, so there are several things going on. So I don't think I have time to go into the, the different loss functions. I would suggest, well, hopefully we're gonna publish this soon, but the thesis is done. Um, so I, I will, so this is like the implementation details. Uh, no, this is mainly my work in Kuwait. I mean, from our group, yes. So for the evaluation, uh, what we are doing here is um, we have two different experiments. Uh, the first one is the with the the, the Vin DR uh, data set. So you have to see it's the eight level classification. So what we are trying to do is um, we are comparing with what if you just give the segmentation mask and uh, and what if you have both? So the reason why we're giving both is, is important because only with the lungs, uh, it doesn't uh, work as much. So we, we have basically two channels. We have one, the, the, just the lungs and then the entire image. Uh, and, and then we test it using uh, two different data sets and also different uh, benchmark models. So this is the training, as you can see. So we, uh, we are also, uh, we're trying to look at the, the PSNR and you can see like, because now we're generating the lungs, so how, how much it's closer, but we cannot do the PSNR on the, uh, the, the files for which we don't know the ground truth lung image. It's only for the synthetic ones. Um, so this is like how it looks like on the unseen. So uh, completely unseen x-rays, you can see pretty good. Like sometimes you have some artifacts outside and it's there. And so here's the result for the classification. So the idea is like you give both images together and with the proposed method, what we see is we see some improvement uh, with accuracy specificity, not as much, but uh, this is quite low. Just to mention, this is eight class. So F1 score and sensitivity are around. Uh, so most of the papers published in this data set, they have lower performance because of this data imbalance issue. Um, and for the other one uh, experiment, uh, we have this binary classification problem. We are uh, on average doing uh, quite well, but this is still, um, my student needs to do more work before we publish this, which is <laughs> hopefully he's, uh, you know, I don't know if he joined, but I shared the link with. So um, this is kind of still a suboptimal and we are uh, planning to improve, but we see like this is a, a promising direction because we are seeing improvement in, in the, the normal and the, and the average cases. Uh, this is uh, better than segmented and actual X-ray. So basically, it's better than just the X-ray image or just the segmented image. But together, it is better. And then we also did a subjective evaluation. We showed uh, ten pair of images to five radiologists and asked them some questions. So you can see, like, 
uh, long features are more visible and easy to interpret from the image. So most of them agreed, some did not. Um, and so I think the question four was quite interesting and most insightful. Like basically we, we talked to some radiologists at Hopkins as well. They were saying, you know, uh, we have to look at both images. That is a issue, but they do agree that having both images is helpful, but just the long image uh, alone is not helpful. Um, our models is also saying the same thing. Like if you combine them in the input, uh, we are getting better results. And we also randomly downloaded some images from Google and they, they seem to be working you know, quite well. We gave like a, you know, the hip image and it deleted everything. So even if it, it never saw a, like a image like this before, but it knew that there's no lungs here. So, so it's kind of validating a way. So um, finally, this is an animation showing uh, how the transformation looks like. And so in the segmented lung, you see the rib cage. One of the things the radiologist told us, like, you know, we need the rib cage for reference. Like, okay, in the third rib cage on the right lung. So that's one of the reasons they, they don't want to see only the lungs. Um, so uh, finally, this is the conclusion of part three. And uh, we feel like, you know, we are, there needs to be more work in the validation and, and, and probably one of the things could be done is using this as a feature extractor, like now because, uh, because we have CT scan data and CT scan images have all this labeling sometimes and there's also organ labeling uh, networks. But in the X-ray, if we can separate them out and then uh, do the network, uh, you know, learning in the separate, the, the, the more deeper layers, there may be more uh, effective ways of classification. So these are some references and uh, I want to, you know, acknowledge my students. So Zunaid Rafi was involved in two of these works. He's really outstanding student. He's still looking for graduate, uh, you know, for PhD programs. So Uday Kamal is already at Georgia Tech doing his PhD. Kausar Ahmed still working uh, in Bangladesh, maybe uh, going for higher studies soon. Uh, Pro Professor Mahabashirin is, uh, a radiologist and she helps us a lot uh, on different projects. Thank you very much. Uh, I will finish my talk here. Yeah. It's a good talk. Uh, this is Narsimhan again. Uh, I have a question about uh, practical usability of these uh, techniques. It's great that you have uh, developed these uh, uh, using AI deep learning techniques. Uh, one of the problems we had 20, 30 years, 40 years back was that the practical usability in the hospitals, I don't know how acceptable it is today. Earlier, they were not uh, willing to accept image processing, scannings, and how the computer uh, produced these images uh, even because there is a lot of litigation in the health network, as you know, in the United States. Uh, how acceptable it is today, uh, given the litigations have uh, gone even further up in the ramp as we speak? Thank you very much for the question. I think this is a very, very important question. and. Uh, because there's a big ethical question there. Like, you know, if you have AI doing diagnosis, then who's responsible for what? It's uh, the analogy I like to give is, you know, is the, the pilot, right? You know, the, we, we ride the planes mostly, you know, most of the times it's running on autopilot, right? Landing even, but, the, but if we, you know, tell somebody like this plane is run without a pilot, we will not ride that, you know, we will not get on board because we want to know like an experienced pilot is you know, there. So. Same, I think, goes in this scenario. Like, AI is only helping the radiologist. It's coming up with suggestions. It, it can mark some regions. There's already some commercialized tools, like FDA-approved tools for lung nodule detection. Um, and uh, if you have time, I can show you some of the work that we are doing for automatic report generation. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all the things that, I mean, I, I have given a talk in the Radiology Society in Bangladesh uh, also, I presented last year at, at Hopkins, uh, the CMIMI conference, and uh, these kind of things are real and they're happening now. There are lots of companies in there. So uh, I think uh, the field is slowly transitioning into a phase where 
uh, AI and radiologists are working together uh, to make the best possible diagnosis with a shortest amount of time. Yeah, I agree with you in terms of helping the so-called experts, radiologists and doctors who diagnose those, these problems. Uh, so A is to, still a long way to be accepted in that uh, scenario. It looks like the way you're talking about. So uh, any, thank you, Narashiman. Appreciate that. Uh, anybody from the web, uh, you can chime in or you can put a question in the chat box. I can read it out uh, for the speaker. Otherwise, uh, anybody else on the audience? You have a question? Okay, sure. So my question was uh, how we do PPG with wearable device. So can we do X-ray with uh, like mobile phone image or uh, IR image? What are the constraints? Or we can add additional sensor. Um, thank you for the question. Um, you mentioned PPG. So PPG, uh, you know, it's, it's optical, right? Uh, so you have the red light and the infrared light going and you look, check the reflectivity um, and then you can determine uh, the oxygenation in the blood. But X-ray, I mean, I don't know if you are familiar with the instrumentation of an X-ray. You need like a vacuum tube and then uh, you have an electron beam and then you have generated the X-ray beams and it, it's hazardous. You cannot have it on the smartphone, I mean, unfortunately, but so, um, but uh, what was the other question? Like, like my follow-up question was, uh, since you mentioned the third work that uh, extracting uh, like clean images, so maybe some sort of ray we are putting and maybe we are getting like hazy image and then synthetically getting clear image. Can we do that or is it like impossible? I mean, again, anything you do enhancement, or of X, I mean, any kind of enhancement you do with AI, uh, it will depend on what it was trained on. So there's, you know, there's a caveat to that. Sometimes it's, so uh, the idea is, again, the radiologist is doing the same thing. It's, they, they have seen a lot of data. They know how human body looks like. So he can, or she can tell like, you know, you know how, where to look and which organs are overlapped. So the idea is the same with, if we can have enough data to train the models, it will try to interpolate like, okay, this is how probably the lungs should look like, but you can never be sure, right? There can always be some errors. There's a question from the web, uh, uh, Professor Celia Sanaj. Um, is there any correlation between subjective and objective evaluation? Um, instead of serial dense net block, why not parallel blocks were used? Any justification? Thank you very much for the question. Um, so, uh, yes, this, we've seen uh, the, in the subjective test, the, the, uh, the, the reason for doing that was to see if this is actually useful for the radiology, the practicality of it. That's something we always do for any of our projects. So that's why we did the subjective evaluations. And the correlation uh, we've seen is, as I mentioned, that basically the radiologist agrees that uh, having both images is the best for for them you know to evaluate uh, the medical image but not a single one in the algorithm also we've seen the same uh, we kind of come to the same conclusion where uh, you know separately if we give only the x-ray image only the lung image uh, their performance is not the best uh, but only uh, when we have together we have better result but again this is still uh, as i mentioned the thesis has just been completed and uh, we will uh, work further to improve it. And I hope like we will get improved results. Thank you. Uh, any other question with the web or I think we are done here. Um, uh, last, any last chance, anybody else? So I, maybe I'll ask a very, you know, uh, I'm not, not obviously an expert in this area, but I'm more like communi communication networking kind of guy, a little bit of computer science. Uh, so again, I think going back to Narashiman's question about applicability, usefulness, uh, and now that you are also joint faculty with Johns Hopkins, are you trying to apply this in some of the hospitals, working with the doctors? Um, what, what is the roadmap, you know, from the thesis to the actual practice? So, um, yes, very good question. So we, we, have, we are trying to work uh, uh, 
you know, with, uh, you know, the industry. So as I mentioned, like uh, one of my students is exploring the, the, uh, the business side of it, which is of course not our strong suit. We are still working on that. Um, the idea is like, um, I think I mentioned this a little bit in the during the COVID part. So I will share a funny story and then answer your question. So the COVID, the COVID times, the doctors were saying, um, special radiologists, you know, please make something uh, to transfer the image from the hospital to my home so that I can just report online, right? That's really helpful because we're getting infected. Doctors are dying. I mean, I really I relate to that. Like we were always <laughs> scared. So we developed something. It's a very simple tool. You upload an image. And from the other side, you can see it and you submit a report. And then when we tried to pilot it, we went to the hospital and the radiologist like, really, yeah, I'm gonna to talk to the director and he's very interested. It is coming from Buet. Uh, and then we were saying, okay, so what's happening? And then he came back and said, you know, um, they don't allow it because the other doctors are saying like, hey, you guys are radiologists. Why would you stay at home? We are taking risk. So you cannot <laughs> use this. You have to come here and do the reporting in person. <laughs> so, <laughs> So uh, it was a you know interesting thing like when we try to work on actual practicality, technology wise, I feel like it, it's more like you know you, you you have full grasp of the problem, you have all the you know aspects of it, you can see it where it was your limit. But when you uh, try to implement, you have these people issues like other social issues, government issues, policy issues. So now going back to the question, this seems to be the most effective way for Bangladesh where. There's a lot of online radiology now going on, like people, you know, rural areas, they have a diagnostic center with an X-ray image or CT scan image. They're sending it to some radiologist in the city area. So we are trying to develop a platform where, you know, they can upload it. There are actually now a lot of competitors now. So it's not an easy uh, space to work in, but our idea is to incorporate AI with that and then propose a better solution. So that's why we were, as I mentioned, I gave a talk in the radiology society where all the radiologists kind of, you know, getting familiar with AI. And so that's how my roadmap is like, but this is actually not, uh, nothing to do with the Hopkins work uh, because in, in Hopkins, mostly what we do is um, more like innovation work on medical devices or other solutions for, for global health. So I have, I want to go back to the uh, domain variability problem. Yes. So um, how does domain variability affect performance in the case of um, variability within the training data set versus when the, there is a difference between training and the test or target data? Great question. I think this is something I, I touched a little bit upon. In the, in the COVID case, what we had was the, uh, the uh, positive examples, the disease examples are coming from specific sources, maybe China, because more cases were there, for example, or, or some other hospitals. Uh, but all the positive examples coming from, let's say, developed countries, like say NIH, right? Other data sets that was collected beforehand. So they're coming from two different, you know, uh, locations. Then what happens is the model tries to, I mean, finding shortcuts, like the model says, oh, you know, this, this hospital has always has this R mark on the, you know, image. So maybe, you know, that's the feature I should look for. And you know, consequently, that, that same hospital always gives you the COVID positive example. So the algorithm thinks that looking at that mark is going to tell him which one is the COVID case, right? So that was what happening. And that's what happens when you have domain variability within you know, the same data set. And we have the same problem in other, we, we worked on a heart sound classification problem where we had similar issues like, so you have all, if you have all the positive cases, all the disease cases from really critical patients in the hospitals, and then your healthy pay subjects are actually, let's say people like me or students, and you will have a mismatch because you're trying to differentiate uh, between uh, people in the same group, between the disease and the healthy class. And on the other hand, if you have variability uh, within the data set, so for example, that's what happening, uh, like say in, in our case, you have five different hospitals maybe, uh, you mix them all together. That's where uh, what happens is, uh, you have maybe, uh, let's say we are training the models on NIH and other data sets available. Now we are testing it on this pediatric pneumonia data that we collected in Bangladesh. Now what will happen is now the performance, there will be a drop because 
uh, the model did not see this domain before. So that is what kind of domain generalization methods that we proposed uh, is solving. Like it's trying to do this randomization, it's making it learn all these variations. So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So really thank the you. system is only as good as what the data you feed in, right? So yeah. if there is bias in what you're putting in, then it affects the system. Yes. Um, are there any other questions from Yes, here, uh, here Narsiman again. I think telemedicine is uh, very important for unconnected to connected uh, world that Ashutosh is leading that uh, aspect where you can uh, use uh, once you get connected, those remote people can be, uh, they don't have to have exact 100% true X-ray images uh, in analysis but however, if even if they have 90%, that would be great. All right. All right, thanks for the talk. I have just one question in the second work. So how you validated your predicted mask since you didn't have like labels in the images? You used cycle gan, right, to generate uh, images or to increase the data. So what is your ground truth in that case? We can't. So that's why, you know, um, I mean, we, we first visually looked at them and we saw like, oh, they're really crappy. So that's why we developed the cycle can architecture. And then, uh, because there is no mask, we cannot, you know, have our radiologists, you know, mark the lungs for us for 100,000 images, right? So, but that was the idea. Like we try to improve the segmentation mask, but propose a method which doesn't strictly, you know, follow the boundary. It, it knows about the boundary, but it, it's learning based on attention mechanism. So it still has this information from the outside the, you know, the anatomy, right? So that's why when it learns, it, it learns like, uh, you know, how to weight these different elements, the lungs and the heart region, but not like, it's not binary, like not cutting off anything. So that's how I think, uh, you know, that's this was kind of our way of proving that this method is working. It doesn't mean that the, the segmentation is perfect. But we've also, I think, shown in the slide, one of the slides where, even if it is like some imperfection is there, it is still being able to, you know, I mean, average classification accuracy is improved. So that it kind of is, is a proof that, you know, um, we are getting somewhere, you know, in the right direction. But yes, but to answer your question, there's, at this time, I don't have a way to validate uh, the, the other 100,000 images, if the segmentation is correct or not. Thank you so much.